Hi, my name is Frankie. Um, my YouTube channel is Overcoming Frankie, and I founded and I lead um, the Compassionate Fit Company, which you can find on YouTube, on Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and this is my story of surviving suicide. Um, I'm going to try not to edit this, so if there's a gap, there's a gap. <laughs> um, if I need to think of what I need to say and I say um, I'm going to say it. And of course, if you are um, struggling with thoughts of suicide um, or injuring yourself or someone else, please get help. Um, in England, you can call 116 123 from any mobile or landline number for free. Um, and that takes you through to the Samaritans who are, they pick up 24 7 365 um, and they are always there. You also don't need to be in crisis in order to contact them. You can contact them if you just need to talk to someone if you feel alone or lost or whatever. Um, so, yeah, uh, a little bit of background. Um, I grew up in a relatively happy home. Um, I had two older brothers and an older sister, Lizzie, Ben and Josh, in that ascending order. Um, and my brother Josh was born with a life-limiting condition called muscular dystrophy. That was very hard for us as a family to deal with. He was sick a lot. Um, his health balanced on the, what do they say, on the head of a pin. Um, it was very, his he health was fragile. Um, and from the age of 11 onwards, every day was a blessing. We didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, but we did know he was life limited. Um, coming away from that, um, a year after he died, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, I had had previous suicidal thoughts. Um, I made, started to make an attempt and then aborted um, in 2015, which is the year that Josh died. Um, and yeah, other than that, my mental health had sort of been up and down as it is a bipolar. Um, and I was affected very heavily by my brother's death. And then when I was diagnosed with bipolar, I was inpatient for three months and I became very good friends with um, another lady in the hospital called Anna. Um, and our rooms were next to each other and we, you know, you live day to day, door to door, joined at the hip to these people um, who, you're, who you're in hospital with. Um, and two weeks after I was discharged, she committed suicide um, on the ward. Um, and that was extremely traumatic for me, um, to have lost Josh and then to have lost Anna. Um, and both of their deaths impacted me in very different ways. And um, there were various other things that have happened to me that have built up to what's called complex post-traumatic stress disorder or CPTSD and it's where it's either a prolonged um, trauma so a period of abuse maybe um, or when there have been multiple traumas and everything adds up so rather than just the one event which you sort of would call PTSD so someone having a tour in Iraq or if someone you know was violently assaulted um, versus having multiple traumas which is what happened to me um it builds up to complex post-traumatic stress disorder cptsd multiple events um and i was not diagnosed with that for an, another um couple of years um in 2019 in january a very close friend of mine died very suddenly um and she lived in America and it was me and a group of friends online um, who we we were just we messaged constantly um, and because they were all in America there were a couple in Australia like there was always someone awake um, and literally this friend she's called M uh, and she um, she was ill we were all, we're all chronically ill in that group um, but she wasn't necessarily critically ill um, I do know her cause of death but I'm not going to share it on here um, because that's not the story I'm telling um, but I found out at three in the morning 
um, because someone else had posted it straight onto Instagram um, and I screamed the sound that I made when I found out Anna had um, died yeah it's a noise that I couldn't make if I tried um, but it's just sort of like this raw emotion um, and it was three in the morning and none of my housemates were awake so I went upstairs and I hammered on Jack's door um, and he let me in and I, I was so hysterical that I couldn't even tell him what happened um, and I managed to get it out and he said are any of your other friends awake and I said yeah I think so so I messaged some of them and I had a very brief video call with one of the la ladies in Australia um, and then that was that I, um, I got back into bed and just pulled the covers over my head and started sobbing and that didn't stop and I had um, uni the next day um, well, I thought I did so I went in for 10 o'clock sobbed the whole way on the bus got into school, cried more and they weren't there, my group wasn't there um, and I, I looked at my phone and they had sent a message saying let's not do today, let's do tomorrow so I dragged myself in feeling awful um, and then I didn't even need to be in so I went back to my flat, uh, to my house and um, it was just so painful and I just wanted the pain to stop and I just thought to myself I can't do this again, I can't lose another person I need to be next um, and it didn't start out as a suicide attempt I just, I wanted to sleep I wanted to not feel the pain anymore um, so I started taking tablets I took everything that I had that would make me sleep so I took some of the meds I take at night um, I took some strong painkillers um, I took, I didn't have any sleeping tablets but I had tablets that make you sleepy I sort of just took them all I was still awake two hours later, took some more and it turned into a gradual overdose which is um, rather than taking a big overdose of a lot of tablets on in one go I'm going to take them gradually um, I'm obviously not going to go into details of what I took um, but that's what happened and I <laughs> Before I did this, I sent a text to a friend saying, this has happened, I feel like I want to take a load of tablets. I probably won't, but I just needed to tell someone. And she never replied to that message. Um, and when I asked her about it a few months later, she said, oh, I don't think I even saw it. Um, and then when my housemates got home, I told them, they came into my room and said are you okay and I said no I've taken too much of X tablet and they were like oh okay and they just sort of sat with me and didn't do anything and they were like can we get some dinner with us and I said no I feel too dizzy when I stand up and they were like oh, okay then and they left um, anyway the next day I decided I would go home to my parents for a few days to sort of spend time with them, grieve, um, also with the tablets that I had been taking and continue to be taking I thought it started to turn into a suicide attempt and so I wrote a letter, um, it was coming up to Jack's birthday uh, so I left his birthday present with my note, um, I wrote a page each to my family um, and a small message to two of my friends and left them on my bed tidied my room locked my door and then went and caught the train back to Nottingham to my family home where I didn't tell my parents um, and I sort of knew what would happen with an overdose and so I went to a friend's house because I don't want my parents to have to find me and I talked to this friend for a couple of hours I told him that I'd taken too much of something and after a few hours he was like so what's happening and I told him and he was like oh shit so we called an ambulance um, and I went to hospital and I got treatment um, and yeah 
the, the doctor said it would have been easier to treat if I'd just taken them all at once and come in but because I'd taken them over a period of time it was sort of building up the damage to my liver and they gave a course of anti-poison which took 23 hours I think um, and I talked to one of our mutual friends one of mine and I was mutual friends in that group I had talked to her and she gave me her number but my, I, I didn't have much charge on my phone um, and anyway about three in the morning I finally called my parents and that was the turning point from um, wanting to die to wanting to live um, I've never heard my mum that upset before um, other than the day that my brother died I heard her howl in the background um, and they came, they both came and sat with me in A&E I was like sort of in and out of um, sleep I guess and they sat with me for a few hours and then they had to go home and sleep they were really tired I was moved onto hospital ward and oh my goodness I felt so awful physically and I um, my mum said to me in a and &E, she said you have to live. She said, think of all the dogs you've not pet yet. <laughs> um, think of all the dogs you've not pet yet. Think of all the friends you've not met yet. Think of all the thing, things you've not written yet. Um, and that was <laughs> having my parents say, you know, how scared they were. I said to the doctor, well, this will reverse the damage, won't it? And he said, we don't know because you took them over such a long period of time, we don't know if it'll work. And I was like, suddenly confronted with the fact that I might die. And I suddenly didn't want to. And I got very distressed about that, and then I didn't want my parents to leave. Anyway, they left. And I, it was about the time that it would be for my housemates to get up. Um, so I phoned them. I said, when you're all up, can you get into the room together? Um, I've got something to tell you and I told them and they were just dead silent um, I could hear two of them crying um, and that that was the other thing that turned me around from wanting to die to wanting to live was hearing their reactions and realising how loved I was by my parents and by them um, and anyway, I had an experience in the chapel, I asked my dad when I'd been, basically the treatment ran three different um, IV infusions over the course of the first one was an hour, the next one was like three hours and then the next one was like 20 hours, so it was 24 hours. I asked my dad when I was unhooked between two bags if he would take me to the chapel in the church. And we went and we prayed and I was listening, I looked through some chat conversations with them that I had with them um, and listened to some of her voice messages that she sent me and then I put um, a song on a praise or worship song um, and I sit, sat there and I prayed in the chapel because I was scared that I might die and I suddenly didn't want to because I didn't want to leave these people who were so upset hearing what had happened I don't know how how they would react if I actually did die and I was very scared and I heard very clearly um, say um, come on girly not yet right as I was thinking am I gonna die come on girly not yet and she's never said those words to me that's the kind of thing that she'd say and I looked on my phone to see if I played a message no it was still on YouTube playing the song and I looked up and I saw a window in the chapel and her face was pressed against the window. And me and her had both lost a sibling. She'd lost her older sister Haley to the same disease that she had. And um, she was there. We talked about death and how we viewed death and what we thought the afterlife looked like. And we said we think when the person, when we really, really need that person, they can push their face up against the one-way glass and we can see them. And there she was at a window pushing her face up against the glass. And I knew that she was with Haley and holding hands. And then I saw Haley, um, that's her sister, and they walked away smiling together. And then I saw Josh. 
and I had never had any dreams of him. I'd never heard him talk to me. I had never had anything like that from him before. And I thought, M brought him to me. Um, because And I don't think it was a hallucination, I believe they were angels. Um, and I felt calm. And it, it made me know that Josh was there for me. I know that he's here with me now. Um, and that got me through the last hours of treatment and over the next few months I took time off from uni and no one asked where I was. I took some time off to come back here with my parents to recover um, physically and mentally. Um, I had a lot of visits from the home treatment team, mental health crisis team. Um, they came every, every day, then every other day and then a few times a week and then once a week and then they stopped sometime in March maybe April um, and there's a bit in the musical Dear Evan Hansen where he talks about he fell from a tree or he threw himself from a tree and he lay there on the floor and he thought any second now any second now someone's gonna come and get me and I was I was in hospital waiting and waiting for someone to notice I wasn't at uni waiting for someone to message and ask where I was, waiting for that friend to respond to that text saying, I feel like I want to kill myself. And then I tried and no one text, no one called, no one asked me where I was. And I had a meeting with my tutors uh, like a couple weeks later to talk about the next steps. And they said, do you want us to tell um, them anything? And I said, I don't think I want you to tell them what happened, but tell them that my mental health isn't good, I won't be in for a while and that I'd appreciate for them to message me and I know for a fact that my tutor did do that in the, the group where everyone was there and she said she, Frankie would be happy for you to text her and no one did. Um, so <laughs> actually I had one of my housemates and the person that I text both said why didn't you tell me? I said I did. So why didn't you ask for help? I did. I sent that text. I sat on my bed with them sitting on my bed and I told them what I'd done and no one did anything. I recovered obviously from that attempt and when I went into when it was my birthday oh. sorry Nelly the elephant when it was my birthday, um, yeah. I went into uni a couple of days later to have a one-to-one -one with one of my tutors, the, my writing tutor, who was like at the time my favourite tutor, um, because I like to write, and I invited people um, to come for drinks with me, and no one was going to come. I think three people came. Um, people made excuses. They just didn't want to go. And I said to my writing tutor, I said to Steph, if this was my funeral, I bet they'd all be there. And I told her what had happened and she, she took my shoulders and she said, you've got at least 20 more years of writing before you can make that decision. Um, and things that have got me through any further feelings of suicide are think of all the dogs I have yet to pet think of all the things that I haven't written that I need to write um, and telling my story um, and the, the thing that always tipped the balance for me of live or die was my loved ones um, and the fact that I can't lose anyone else because I just don't emotionally have it in me um, well, 
that with with Josh and M and Haley at the window that has proved to me that they are there and Josh still cares and he still watches me and he still loves me and he's still there for me and even though I can't get a reaction from him I know that he's reading the things that I'm writing I know that he is proud of me I know he is and I believe M was indeed an angel put into my life to bring all of that about to to realize all of that and she was an angel in life and she was an angel in death and I can't be more thankful of her and indeed after her death I lost an auntie in the same year last year I lost M in January my auntie in March my nana in May my um grandma on the 12th of November and my granddad on the 13th was it yeah or maybe it was 11th and 12th I lost my grandma and my granddad back to back in December the same week that Josh's birthday was and for me to have gone from that in January saying I, I cannot survive another loved one's death to surviving my auntie my nana, my granddad and my grandma and in January I thought I will never be able to do that and then I did it four times over um, don't get me wrong it's still incredibly hard losing people doesn't get easier you just learn more ways to cope and your life grows around the scenarios that happen they don't shrink emotionally you just increase your life around the grief um, so yeah that's I guess that's it um, I am extremely fortunate that I'm alive I'm extremely fortunate to have such living friends and family However, <laughs> no one else cared, you know, um, and when I told people, they didn't do anything. So, I just, I am still in a bit of shock about that. So, if someone near you tells you that they're thinking of suicide, even if it's half past ten at night and you're about to go to bed, you fucking message them you you message them back you call them you call them even if it's for five minutes to tell them samaritan's number you reply you reply to that text because you don't know what they're going to do um and if someone tells you i've taken too many of x y and z tablet you take them to the nearest emergency department immediately you don't wait around you don't go oh we'll see how you feel in the morning you take them and you write down what they've taken and you take them to hospital or you're gonna lose them that's I think that's ultimately my message here is that I've survived suicide but not because I told people and they rescued me because I ended up having this conversation with this friend when I was at that house and they didn't even stay with me and they 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 did what you should do they got me to ER and then they left me in the professional care and that's what you need to do if someone tells you they're thinking of killing themselves or that they've they've attempted that on their life you need to make sure that they get help like I say in the UK if you need help you call 116 123 um, you can call if you're concerned about someone as well um, and I believe Samaritans will follow up with a phone call with that person I believe I may be wrong um, but yeah you don't you don't mess around when it comes to suicide you really don't um, like when there's someone there saying I want to die and then two days later they're dead that was a preventable death um, and you have a responsibility as a fellow human being with empathy and feelings you have a responsibility to look after those around you those you love because what's the point in loving someone if you don't love them enough to save their life I guess I don't know what else to say now, um, but yeah.
that's my story of surviving suicide um, and life after loss. <sighs> yeah. Hey, I know that I said that I wasn't going to uh, edit this, but um, I figured that I ended it in a bad place. So I'm back. It's another day. It's like a week later. Um, I wanted to talk about um, what happened after and like how my life changed. So I think what I got up to was saying that if someone tells you they want to hurt themselves, you take it seriously. Um, and I guess that's sort of the message for people who are watching this and don't want to kill themselves. But for anyone who has thought about it or wants to and is watching this video I want to tell you that life does go on um, and like on Thursday my project is coming out called Some Good Things and it is about how when you are recovering from an episode of mental health where like for example a suicide attempt in the films and in TV it's sort of portrayed as like someone might try and kill themselves and then by the end of the episode everything's turned round, their life is breezy, they want to live again and in reality that's not it, it's a, it's an uphill battle, it's hard um, and I'm not just going to be like I bounced back and my life was gravy because I've already told you I ended up taking three months off uni um, but because I was so motivated in what I wanted to do once I could see the future again once I could think about living further than just another hour or just another day or just another week my tutors were like we know that you want to actually do this course so we're willing to work with you um, so I handed in assignments late, I got extensions I did like alternative practices so for example one of the things that we had to do was in a group create a 20 minute piece of devised workshop like an interactive workshop um, in a group and obviously I didn't have a group um, because I was handing it in like six months late so uh, they let me do something different um, and I went in in some holidays and I did like three assessments in like two days um, which was fine went well I passed them all um, and when it was coming up to a year since M died, usually on anniversaries I get very upset and I just kind of hide and then drop out from the life for a few days and I was like I'm not going to do that and would not want me to do that and I know that I will feel worse if I do that. So I did go into uni, we only had a half day um, and then I had friends around in the evening and I cooked a real nice meal and I just asked everyone to bring something so like some people brought some drinks, some people brought some food um, and we went off to a field and we lit off a lantern and we had some sparklers we had some cake um, and just had like a little celebration and surrounded myself with people that love me and that I love um, and it was a really good way to um, deal with the anniversary and like we had pictures of M I actually have all of them is up in this room somewhere she is up in her somewhere. I don't know where, but she is up. <laughs> um, and yeah, just sort of, it's called emotion regulation where you feel shit and rather than do something that makes you feel worse, like self-harm or dropping out of life for a few days, you do something that makes you feel good. So rather than feeling grief and being like, I'm gonna feel sad, I was like, I'm gonna feel grief, I'm gonna eat some good cake and have some good company, I'm gonna do something good. So like, that's one of the things that I do to like, try and make things better rather than letting things get worse like I did when M died um, and it's hard you got to work at it um, especially when it's like trauma because your brain doesn't process trauma properly um, it, the reason that you have things like flashbacks and like very vivid memories and the, we the reason that people get PTSD is because your brain just files something away really really quickly so that it doesn't need to focus on it for too long which means that they process it in like a different way and you process it in a very sensory kind of way whereas everything else sort of gets like reviewed and like filed away neatly this is like a cupboard that you open shove something in there then just slam it shut and hope that it doesn't open again and then the next time you go and retrieve those memories they all fall out of the cupboard and you end up in a mess um, so it's not 
an easy thing to do but you have to work at it and I am now what 18 months past that suicide attempt 19 months past and I am doing something I love I'm writing I am raising awareness um, I am trying to prevent <laughs> anyone else going through that um, I have finished my degree um, I don't think it's in this room, but I do have my certificate now. Um, I got a 2-1, um, which is really good, especially, like I say, given that I handed a bunch of assessments in, like, six months late. Um, I, yeah, I finished my degree. I have, like, a few good friends. And you know what? You don't need many friends. You just need a few. You need a few good friends. Maybe one good friend. And that's it. You just need one person to know that you make an impact on that person which keeps you alive um, because they're counting on you and yeah I I have done well and now we're out of battery so that is the end of the video I did well I'm okay life is so hard but you just have to work at it because it's so worth it in the end that's it <laughs>